Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the adaptive immune system and immunosuppressants. Okay, so we're now going to look at uh, two drugs uh, which are going to stop proliferation of B cells and T cells and hence stop the adaptive immune system. Uh, but they're going to work in a rather different way from cyclophosphamide. Remember, cyclophosphamide is a uh, nitrogen mustard drug which is used as an anti-cancer chemotherapy and it stops proliferation in pretty much all cells of the body. Whereas the two drugs that we're going to look at now, which are called mycophenolate and azofiaprin, okay, so mycophenolate is one of these, and then the other drug is known as azofiaprin, okay. Uh, so, Aza Fireprin. Fire. Whoops. Fireprin. Okay. Uh, these two drugs are going to work by stopping proliferation, but they're going to be far more selective for the cell type that they work on than uh, was cyclophosphamide. So mycophenolate and azathioprine are going to stop proliferation specifically in B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Now let me explain how they work. So we'll start with mycophenolate. Okay, so mycophenolate works by inhibiting an enzyme known as in inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, so this is going to inhibit an enzyme called inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, and this enzyme is going to be important in uh, producing guanosine triphosphate. Okay, so, well, guanosine monophosphate first, but of course guanosine triphosphate um, comes from guanosine monophosphate. Okay, right, so both of these drugs are actually going to work by stopping the synthesis of certain organic bases. And if you stop the synthesis of the organic bases, then you're not going to be able to produce DNA, okay? And you're also not going to be able to produce mRNA. So you're going to stop transcription because you won't be able to uh, synthesize mRNA because you won't have um, the organic bases needed. And you're also going to stop DNA replication because to replicate the DNA you need a huge number of organic bases and if you don't have them then you're not going to be able to replicate the DNA either. So before we see all of that however let's talk about what it actually does. So it inhibits this enzyme inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. So what does this enzyme do? Well firstly we need to see what is inosine monophosphate which is what it's going to act upon. So we'll start off with what is inosine monophosphate. Okay, so it would be useful to know what inosine actually is. So inosine is the name for ribose sugar plus an organic base known as hypoxanthine. Okay, so let me put this, and I'm squashed for space now that I've put this line here. This was supposed to be um, the forward uh, line for the reaction, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit it all in now. But anyway, we'll have a go. So I'll squash this up over here. So inosine is the name for a ribose sugar plus uh, an organic base that is called hypoxanthine. Okay, so we usually consider the four main organic bases, which are cytosine, guanine, uh, adenine, and thymine. But hypoxanthine is another organic base. It's not used within DNA. However, uh, it's important in uh, the steps to create the organic bases that uh, we need uh, for DNA and RNA. Okay, so uh, it is important, basically. It's one of the forerunners to the organic bases which are used in DNA. Okay, so let's see the structure of uh, inosine. Okay, so uh, we'll start with the organic base, hypoxanthine. So hypoxanthine is a purine organic base, so it has the uh, pyrimidine ring here, okay, which is the name for a uh, six-membered ring where two of the members are nitrogens. So we have two nitrogens here, and they have a single carbon in between them. 
okay? Uh, and you have alternating double and single bonds, at least in the pure pyrimidine ring you would have alternating double and single bonds. In hypoxanthine, we're not going to quite have a pure pyrimidine ring. Instead, where you would have another double bond here, you're going to have a carbonyl group here and a hydrogen off this nitrogen. Now, we're drawing a skeletal structure here, so um, we don't show carbon, so these corners are implicitly carbons here, and also we don't show hydrogens coming off carbons, so um, there would be a hydrogen coming off here, um, but we don't show that, okay? Right, then you've also got another ring coming off here, which is why I didn't say you would have hydrogens coming off these two carbons, uh, and this is what's known as an imidazole ring. Okay, so let me just draw some of these structures out and we'll do away now with this uh, trying to show the reaction here. Okay, so uh, let me firstly draw out a pyrimidine ring. Okay, so the pyrimidine ring, remember, was the six membered ring where you had alternating double and single bonds. You would have double bonds here and then single bonds here. Okay. So this is the pyrimidine ring, this is the skeletal structure for a pyrimidine ring. Okay, now the next type of ring we're going to have is what's known as an imidazole ring. So let me put this one in. This one is a five-membered ring, so it's a pentagon rather than a hexagon. And again it has two nitrogens in, so here are the two nitrogens. And they'll be separated now by a single carbon. Okay, and you have a double bond here and a double bond here. So where there are carbons which only have three bonds, then implicitly there will be another hydrogen off those carbons. And this nitrogen has a hydrogen off. And remember, you must show hydrogen atoms that are off non-carbon atoms in skeletal structures. So this is what's known as an imidazole ring. Now, in the organic base uh, hypoxanthine, what you're going to do is connect a pyrimidine ring to an imidazole ring. You're going to join this one on here, just like I'm showing here. And uh, that will create you what's known as a purine ring. So a pyrimidine ring plus an imidazole ring is going to give you a purine ring. Okay, so hypoxanthine is a purine organic base except for the fact that we've modified this double bond here. We've split the second of those two bonds and then put a carbonyl group off here and a hydrogen off that nitrogen. Okay, so this is the structure of hypoxanthine. So let me, uh, oh, it's up here. Well, well, I'll put it anyway. I'll put it here. So this is hypoxanthine. Now in pure hypoxanthine, what you'd have to have is a hydrogen off this nitrogen, but of course we want to talk about inosine, so we want to add the hypoxanthine onto a ribose uh, sugar, so let's now put a ribose sugar there. Okay, so ribose is a five-membered ring here, where one of the members is an oxygen and the other four members are carbons. Okay, then you have two alcohol groups coming down here, one here one here, and then you have the fifth carbon coming off up here, and this will then have an alcohol group coming off it, which will be attached, oh well, wait, 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 initially, this will just be an alcohol group, okay, so add a hydrogen onto there, imagine adding a hydrogen onto there, uh, that then will be inosine, that will be ribose here, plus hypoxanthine, okay, so this whole structure that I've now drawn would be, um, Inosine. So if you put a hydrogen off this oxygen, that will be inosine now. To convert it into inosine monophosphate, all you do is then uh, stick a phosphate group here, which is why I didn't put that hydrogen off that uh, oxygen here. Okay, so here's a single phosphate group on there. So that now is the structure of inosine monophosphate. So this is the substrate for this enzyme, inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, so what is it going to do to the inosine monophosphate? Uh, well, basically, it's going to convert it into something known as xanthosine monophosphate. Okay, so let me talk about the difference between inosine monophosphate and what's known as, so we're going to convert this into, I'll try and use this arrow now, xanthosine monophosphate, okay? And inosine monophosphate is often abbreviated to IMP for inosine monophosphate, and xanthosine monophosphate 
is often abbreviated to ZMP, okay, for short. So this is Z for xanthosine monophosphate. Okay, so uh, how is xanthosine monophosphate going to be different from inosine monophosphate? Well, basically, if I go over onto the other page, uh, just for a minute, okay, so xanthosine, just like inosine, is uh, hyposanthine plus ribose. Xanthosine is xanthine plus ribose. So xanthine is another organic base, basically, that's very, very similar to hyposanthine that was the organic base in inosine. Okay, so we're going to slightly modify this inosine monophosphate we're not going to do anything to the ribose, we're not going to do anything to the phosphate, we're going to modify the organic base, we're going to turn it from being a hyposanthine organic base to being a xanthine organic base. Now how do we do this? Well basically, you're going to break the second uh, bond, this double bond between this nitrogen and this carbon here. You're going to bind a hydrogen off that nitrogen, and then you're going to put a carbonyl group off this carbon here. Okay, so let's discuss this in a bit more detail in the, um, over the way. Okay, so we won't draw the entire structure. Instead, we'll just draw the organic base, because that's what's changing, not the ribose or the phosphate. That remains exactly the same. All we're going to modify is this hyposanthine. So let's redraw out our hyposanthine here. Okay, and it would actually probably help now to draw a molecular formula, uh, simply because then we uh, will have the hydrogens on as well. And it will help in a moment when we try and understand the chemical reaction that's going to happen. So, here is the pyrimidine ring. We have a double bond here and here. We have a carbonyl group coming off there, hydrogen coming off this nitrogen, and hydrogen coming off that carbon. That's the important bit that we didn't show before um, because we were drawing a skeletal structure. Okay, then we have these two nitrogens down here in the imidazole ring. Here's the imi bond, which is this double bond between uh, a nitrogen and a carbon. So whenever you have a double bond between a nitrogen and a carbon, it's known as an imi bond. So that's the basis for the name of that ring as an imidazole ring. And then this nitrogen will be linked down to the ribose, and this carbon will also have a hydrogen off it, which we now have to show. So this is the hyposanthine within uh, the inosine monophosphate. So hyposanthine is the name for this organic base, and it's within the inosine monophosphate. Okay, now we're going to now convert this to what's known as xanthine. Uh, well, xanthine. Okay, so let's show the structure now of xanthine, and then we'll talk about how we're actually going to undertake uh, this reaction. Okay, so again, it's got a very similar structure. It's got this uh, pyrimidine ring again. Okay, so here's this carbon, the nitrogen, the carbon. We haven't made that much of a modification, only a small change. What we're going to do is we're going to put a carbonyl group off here and a hydrogen off this nitrogen. And that's the only change we've made, so the rest of it's going to remain exactly the same. So the imidazole ring down here remains exactly the same as what it was before. So a hydrogen off this carbon down here, and then that nitrogen will still be attached to the ribose sugar. So all we've do done is taken this hydrogen off this carbon here, broken the second of those bonds in the double bond between this carbon and this nitrogen, and then attached an oxygen onto this carbon, doubly bonded, and a nitrogen onto the sorry, a hydrogen onto this nitrogen. So this reaction is what's going to be undertaken by the inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, so how do you actually do this reaction? Well you're going to bring in a water molecule here. This is what's going to provide the oxygen. And then what you can imagine doing is splitting both of these bonds between um, 
the oxygen and the hydrogen, so break both of these bonds. And I want to just stress that I am not going to give you an electron flow diagram. I'm not going to show you exactly where the electrons move. I'm just going to help you to understand how this uh, reaction makes sense by keeping track of where uh, electrons are and how everything adds up, basically. How the elements on one side match the elements on the other side. I'm not going to attempt to give you an actual electronic mechanism. Okay, so, uh, what's going to happen, what you can imagine happening anyway, is splitting both of these bonds here, okay? Now, in these single bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogens, one of the electrons will be provided by the oxygen and the other by the hydrogen, okay? So the covalent bonds consist of two electrons, one from the oxygen, one from the hydrogen. Imagine giving uh, the electrons from the oxygen back to the oxygen and the electrons from the hydrogens back to the hydrogens. So this will create a normal oxygen atom and uh, two hydrogen atoms, okay? Which are not ions, they're neutral. They have all of their electrons, they're the pure elements. Okay, then imagine breaking this second of those two bonds between this carbon and this nitrogen. And again, imagine taking one of the electrons back to the carbon and one back to the nitrogen. Then cut this bond here between the carbon and the hydrogen and give one electron back to the carbon and one back to the hydrogen. This carbon now has two free electrons, one that it got from this bond and one that it got from this bond. It's now going to bind those with the oxygen. Okay, so you're going to get a double bond. The oxygen has two free electrons, the carbon has two free electrons. They will pair up to form two pairs and you'll therefore get this double bond here. Now we have three hydrogens and we also have a nitrogen which has a, uh, a lone electron. Okay, so we'll bind one of these hydrogens to that nitrogen. Okay, and that gives us this bond here. Then we have two hydrogens, which are perfectly pure element hydrogens. Okay, so they are a proton with an electron. That's what hydrogen consists of, a proton with an electron orbiting around it. At least the most common isotope of hydrogen is that. This is actually the protium uh, isotope of hydrogen. Of course, um, there are other isotopes that are less common of hydrogen, which have neutrons in the center as well. Um, but this is the most common form, which is just a single proton with an electron around it. Okay, so here's the proton at the centre, and here's the electron around it. Okay, so you've got two protons, effectively, with two electrons, and you're going to give these to a molecule of NAD. Okay, so nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, which is basically a molecule which can accept uh, hydrogen atoms like this, it can accept two protons and two electrons, or two hydrogen atoms. And this is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And for short, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is abbreviated to NAD. Okay, now this is oxidized NAD. Okay, so this is the NAD before it has been given the two hydrogen atoms. Once um, it has the two hydrogen atoms, it becomes what is known as reduced NAD. And you write this NADH to denote that it has hydrogens. However, this notation is a little bit confusing uh, because um, it looks as though it's only received one hydrogen atom, but in fact it's received two, basically. So this is what's known as reduced NAD. Okay. So... Overall, the reaction that the um, inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase is going to catalyze is it's going to catalyze the conversion of inosine monophosphate uh, to xanthosine monophosphate. Okay, so the nucleotide, which has hyposanthine as its organic base, is going to be converted to the nucleotide, which has um, xanthine as its organic base. Okay, so hyposanthine is going to be converted into xanthine. Okay, and in that process, you're going to bring in water here, and you're also going to need a molecule of NAD. Okay, and then from it, you're going to generate a molecule of reduced NAD. 
Okay, so that's the overall reaction that is catalyzed by this enzyme, inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, what can then happen is you convert this xanthazine monophosphate into guanosine monophosphate, which is one of these organic bases which is actually needed uh, for uh, the production of DNA and RNA. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.